Hello, welcome to Brighton Den. Um, unlike the kids next door, feel free to take photographs and tweet and stuff. And uh, if you want to say nice things, if you don't want to say nice things, keep them yourself. <laughs> <coughs> Hello, everybody. I am Sophie Cook. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> Woo! Um, four years ago, I was sitting in the pitch of Chapman for the six grand of Bally. As a football club that I've supported my entire life, AFC Bournemouth got promoted to the Premier League as Football League champions. People in football talk about the Premier League as being the dream. Well, I was a Bournemouth fan, our dream was actually to still have a football club the following season. And I remember the days when we'd go down to the, to, down to the square in town with buckets collecting coins just to stop the business from, uh, the football club from going out of business. Break a breaker for a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so what, when we took turn that phone drop earlier, obviously, <laughs> the, obviously the sound guy. Right? That, that, that was an unsound desk. <laughs> just for the people on Facebook. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> lost where it was. Anyway, so, so yeah, so it was. I mean, this this was the greatest day in the history of my football club, and I was stood there on the pitch. And I'm being sprayed with champagne by footballers, which sounds so much cooler than it actually is. In rea- reality, it's icky and sticky, and it bubbles up the camera kit. And despite this amazing moment, I was terrified. I was terrified because I knew that that summer I was going to tell them something that I thought would end my career in football. I'd known that I was transgender since I was about seven years old. I remember going on a family holiday to a, to a holiday park in South Wales. And we all piled out in my mum and dad's Ford Anglia, which for those of you that was younger than me is the car from Harry Potter. It was a real car, it didn't fly. Um, so by the time we'd driven from Bournemouth all the way to South Wales, I think my parents were sick and tired of these annoying children in the back of the car. Message to children. And, um, I mean, this was in 1974. And, um, good parents in fact, there was a bottle of coke and a packet of crisps. So, at the start of the holiday, my parents flew off to the bar, my brother went off to play football, and I went off to meet the other kids. And these were kids that I'd never seen before and I was never going to see again. And when I met them, I went up and went, Hi, my name's Jenny. And all week I was Jenny. Obviously, at seven years old, I was quite cute. I'm still quite cute, but got a little bit like that. But that's the thing, I mean, no one batted an eyelid, no week. I, I was Jenny. At the end of the week, my parents came out of the bar and started loading up the pool. But they fed us in the meantime. They had just um, chicken nuggets or turkey twizzlers or something, whatever was healthy back in the 1970s. Uh, packets of Watsits or Frazzles. <laughs> People think of Frazzles. Um, but, but my parents were loading up the four down here, and these kids came across and went, Bye, Jenny! And my parents looked at me kind of weird. And I went, Weird, though, so I've been doing that all week, absolutely no idea what they're talking about. But this was the mid 1970s. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have that knowledge. We didn't have LGBT role models. We certainly didn't have trans role models. In fact, the only time you ever heard about trans people was if the Sunday paper was crucifying someone. And because of that, I thought I was the only person in the world that had ever felt this way. And because of that sense of isolation, that sense of wrongness, at the age of 12, I first tried to take my own life. At the age of 16, I joined the Royal Air Force. I was third generation Air Force. My dad had been on phantoms in Germany during the 70s and my granddad had been out in Burma during the Second World War. So I've been brought up on stories of the Air Force and I became a jet engine technician on Tornado Squadron. And one sunny August afternoon, when I was 18 years old, I was walking between two of the Harland aircraft shelters I heard bang. 
So immediately went to the source of the noise, and there'd been an explosion on one of the aircraft. And a colleague of mine who was 19 years old had lost his arm in that explosion. I was the first person there. I put a tool on the camera and saved his life. Now, despite that the military and the Royal Air Force have had a hundred years of experience of post-traumatic stress or shell shock as they used to call it, they didn't have a clue what to do with me. In fact, the first thing they did was actually ship me off out to Germany. I think what they were thinking was, well, well, we'll take them away from the source of the pain. But actually what they were doing was taking me away from my support network. Everyone that knew what I was going to. So I ended up in Germany with people who were talking about this incident as a rumour. And, and they, they were making up all sorts of things. And, and they had no idea that I'd actually been involved in this incident. So there I was, 18 years old, still trying to do because it doesn't get better on its own. Um, Self-harming, suicidal, using alcohol to try and just numb that pain. And I just want to read you a little bit from my book. Not today, I'll show you something available from the very school stuff there it is. All for those of you in Facebook land, it's available from www.sofacook.me.uk. Oh, sorry, shame this um, Right, this, this bit's a little bit. I think one of the words that people have used to describe my book is brutal. So, does everyone feel up to hearing something that's a little bit brutal? Everyone happy? Alright. So this is 18 years old, stationed in Germany with the Air Force. As I look around the bar, the noise inside my head becomes unbearable. The pain washes over and engulfs me. People's faces become pinpoints in the distance as I retreat deep within, trying to block out their voices. I turn and head, unobserved towards the toilets at the rear of the bar, skirting the pools of light thrown by the lamps above the tables laden with drinks. Once inside, I lock the cubicle door and slump down to the seat, the weight of my pain seemingly drawing me down, crushing me, diminishing me and making me smaller. I reach inside my jacket pocket and pull out my wallet. Inside, hiding my to Deutschmarks, is the tool with which I will set my pain. The razor blade catches the light from the single bare bulb above my head as I turn it over in my hand, feeling the symbolic power of release that resides within it. I look down at my wrists. The skin looks so thin, diaphanous, barely covering the vein that lies beneath. So fragile, so vulnerable, so easy to defile with the blade's cold edge. I sense that the pressure that needs release does not reside there. The darkness lies deep within me, hidden, somehow impenetrable. I move my gaze up my arm, coming to rest on my forearm as I carefully and deliberately roll at the sleeve of my shirt. I bring the blade up, using it to caress the skin before bringing it down in a rapid pass across the flesh. I feel an instant burn of pain, then nothing. A moment passes and then a thin, scarlet line appears. As I watch, the line seems to swell outward and then spread slightly as the line becomes liquid and flows across the pale flesh of my arm. I watch all of this as if watching an abstraction. I do not feel connected to what I see. This is not my arm, my flesh, my blood. I feel no pain from the wound. The physical pain is but an attempt to give form and meaning to the emotional and mental pain that is tormenting my mind. The blade comes down for a second time. The red line makes a neat cross to the first, then again and again. Two scarlet crosses mark the skin. I close my eyes and take a deep breath. My nostrils and lungs filling with a stale smell of human waste and disinfectant. I rest, searching for stillness within myself. Feeling the release, I roll down my sleeve, oblivious to the blood which is stained in the dark material of the deepest black, and, standing to leave, I return the blade to its resting place within my wallet. As I re-enter the bar, the world is exactly as I left it. 
The pool players deliberate over a shot, a couple relax and intimate, choking a booth. And my colleagues greet me at the bar with a friend. Get the drinks in, it's your round. Basically, that was my life for the next couple of decades. I left the airport, so I went out to Saudi Arabia for seven years. Which, if you've never been to Saudi Arabia, don't bother. <laughs> um, obviously, don't. I know a journalist got in trouble on that, but yeah. Anyway, um, so around about 2000. I started to work out what my gender identity actually meant. Um, and I started to transition. I realised that actually this was who I really was. And I, I went through the whole medical thing. I, I got, got referred up to the gender identity clinic at Charing Cross. <coughs> but the world was a very, very different place in 2000. Everywhere I went, I got abused. I got abused in my doctor's waiting room and my GP's response was, well, you chose to do this, so you're going to have to get used to it. Which, first of all, shows that he knows nothing about trans people because you certainly don't choose it. And secondly, he had no empathy as a human being. But I was still going ahead with that. And then my partner got pregnant. And the plan was that our child would have two mothers from the day they were born which back in 2000 was unheard of, especially if one of them was trans. On the day that my son was born, he had a massive seizure and we nearly lost him. And as a result of that seizure, he ended up with a disability. And I remember holding this tiny little baby in my hands, thinking, I can't put that child through the abuse and the pain that I am experiencing every single day. His life is already going to be hard enough as it is without having a trans parent on top of that. So I took Sophie and I murdered her and I buried her for 15 years. Imagine what it's like taking something that's so intrinsically a part of who you are. Whether it's your sexuality, your gender identity, your religion, the love of music, and not just not do them, but deny that they ever existed. I'm pretty sure that everyone in this room can agree that that's not a healthy place to be. And over the next 15 years, I thought about suicide every single day. Even on days that I thought I was doing all right, there were voices back in my head just gently suggesting me that, you know what, maybe there was a way out. And I would just like to read you another passage from the book, since I got back last time I read it from the book. Trees flashed past my open window, creating a strobe effect on my face as the rays of the setting sun are momentarily blocked by their leaves. Ahead of me, the road meanders gently through the villages of the new forest to home. Primal scream come on the stereo, asking the existential question, just what is it that you want to do? Indeed, what do you want to do? Where do you see yourself in five years, five months, five weeks, five minutes? We want to be free. We want to be free to do what we want to do. A 
horns of calf, the, the horns of the song, not the horns of the calf. That wouldn't be very musical, would it? Da, 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 da. Anyway, the horns of the song fill the car with joyous music, celebrating life and love and getting loaded. It all sounds great. Today has been a good day, and now I'm on my way home to my family. I sing along to the song. I'm going to get down, deep down. Do you? Do you really want to get loaded? I don't look, but I know that it's there. My ears don't hear the words, but there they are inside my head. I feel his dark presence beside me. There, but not there. A black void that swallows all hope and joy. But you're not really happy, are you? They will be so much better off without you. His sibilant speech cuts through me like a diamond on glass, destroying my will and draining my strength. You don't deserve to be happy. You don't deserve love. And you certainly don't deserve them. He's always been with me. Reminding me of my worthlessness. Keeping my feet grounded in quicksand that every time happiness tried to enter my life. From that day in my parents' garage at age 12 when I first tried to take my life, he was there beside me, encouraging me to tie the knot. When I cut myself in the toilet to the German bar, he was in the next cubicle, whispering to me under the partition, asking if the person whose life I saved really would have been better off without me doing that. Asking me if life really was better than death. The pain is too great for you to carry. He makes a compelling argument. Don't you wish that it would just end? I do. I do want the pain to end. It seems like I've carried this weight of pain inside my heart since before I can remember. I'm tired. So tired of fighting to survive. To die to sleep. To sleep a chance to dream. I, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil. Quoting Hamlet is a low blow, I think. But he has a point. The dreams that elude us in life may be possible in death, and only then might I be free. You don't even need to do anything, he suggests. All you have to do is not do. Take your hands off the steering wheel, close your eyes, and be at peace. The words are persuasive, offering me a way out to respite from the pain of salvation. As the forest speeds past the window, the sun beginning to set to the west, I close my eyes and take my hands off the steering wheel, immediately feeling the release. Seconds stretched to minutes, then hours and years. Each breath lasts an eternity. Suddenly the demon's hypnotic words are gone, replaced by the giggling, smiling face of no, my baby boy, my love, my world, my everything. Fear returns, as does pain, my eyes snap open, hands grasping at the wheel, frantically searching for control of the vehicle. The car swerves, narrowly missing a road sign, careering from one curve to the other before I can bring the car to a halt in the lay-by. Wheels skidding and gravel flying as I force the brake pedal to the floor. My demon has left me, for now, returning to the deepest, darkest corners of my mind where he lives, glorifying in my despair and pain, waiting for his next opportunity to torment me. I begin to cry, deep, painful sobs, coming from deep within my soul as I grasp the steering wheel, knuckles white, clinging to life, a drowning man holding onto a lifeboat with his fingertips. My head slumps forward onto the top of the steering wheel, exhaustion washes over me. I don't know how much longer I can do this. Instinctively knowing that I'm being watched, I turn my head, and there, beside my open window, is a large black eye inspecting me, asking questions of me. He 
calm, inquisitive face of a pony, his muzzle inches from the window, showing real concern for me. Thanks, I say. Yes, I know. Time to go home. Thank you again. Um, <clears throat> so every single day I, I was struggling with these feelings. And, and it just felt like there was no way out. And then in January, in January, a little bit of it, in January 2015, in of all places to have my epiphany moment, I was in the Hotel Ibis Budget in Bradford, a place where I'm sure many of weary travelers have traveled, just looked out the window and thought, where did my life go wrong? And as I'm looking out the window, there's, there's that grey, slushy, horrible stuff that passes the snow in this country and ground. And there's a dual carriageway, and there's the railway lines, and there's Bradford City Square up on the hill. And it's like what went off in my head. And I suddenly realised that's why you hate yourself so much. So I went into town, bought some clothes, bought some makeup, and the pain just stopped. And I thought to myself, is that all it took to end that pain? But of course it wasn't. Because I then had to go home and effectively take a hand grenade and throw it into my life and see where all the pieces went. So I went back and uh, I told my wife and she said, well, I knew it was going to come back. And then I had to think about how the rest of the world was going to deal with it. <laughs> the thing is, at the time, my youngest daughter was 11 years old. Being 11 years old, she knew all about the Kardashians. I had no idea who they were or what they did. And that hasn't changed in four years since. <laughs> how, how did Kendall Jenner become the quickly said a rich is being here under the age of I don't know what age is. What do you think it should be to come in? Well that's the subject of an attorney. <laughs> anyway, so, so my daughter's talking about this and she starts asking questions about Kate and Jenna. And my wife said to me, she's asking all these questions. Do you think we should tell her? Well I'm one of these people that when you see an opportunity, go for it, because you never ever know if that opportunity will present itself again. So I think within about an hour or so, we'd actually sat down with the kids. And um, the thing is, how can we been for a parent? They were only brought up with strict gender roles. They were free to find their own path. That combination of nature, nurture, society, media, everything else. My, my son, who didn't speak to his, he was five. His first word was car. He's still obsessed with cars, toy cars, car books. Videos on YouTube. You can watch Top Gear this time, thanks, it's presented by Chat. Um, and my daughter was always interested in dance and performing and makeup and fashion. And I sat there with him and I said, You know, the way you always knew you were a boy and you always knew you were a girl? Well, it wasn't like that for me. And that caused me a lot of pain. And I told them that I was going to transition. And in the next five minutes, my daughter went through all five stages of grief in about ten minutes. So she did um, denial, she did arguing and reasoning and all this, and eventually she got to acceptance. And I knew she got to acceptance because she asked me what was in my makeup bag. <laughs> A question that she's only just stopped asking now, four years later, because the answer was always the same. I'm 50 years old. It's the same five products that were in there last time you looked. And like her, she had all these drawers that alphabetized and organized with makeup. I must admit, I know how to draw this organized makeup. <laughs> but they, they basically, she comes there, she goes through it, she goes, Do you want this? And I said to her, 
Well, actually, you gave that to me last time you here, so yeah, take it back. I, th I think my daughter now uses me as an off-site storage area for makeup that her mother doesn't want me to have, or want her to have up. So I told the kids, and, and then I had to think about how the rest of the world dealt with them. And at the time we were pushing for a promotion to the Premier League, and I thought, if I come out now, and the players' form dips, I will get blamed. Because football fans will do that. If the play team's playing well, and then they play badly, it's like whatever changed in the middle, that's what gets the blame. No matter how logical or illogical that is, I thought, I can't be the reason we don't get to the Premier League. Obviously, overinflating my importance in, in the basis of the world, although I must admit that sort of, I joined the club at the same time that Eddie Carroll came back from Burnley, so therefore, our rise to the Premier League was down to me. I mean, <laughs> you've only got to look at, look at the dates, I mean, to see it's all I think Eddie might have had a little bit to do with it. Anyway, <laughs> I did dress. But um, I thought, I can't do this. And the thing is, by this point, I was leading a double life, so I moved to Brighton, and um, during the week I was Sophie. At weekends, I was going back to football matches and pretending to be Steve. Except that people noticed that something had changed. The first thing that happened is I lost five stone in four months because I started caring about myself for the first time in my life. Unfortunately, I put most of it back on. Um, I got both my ears pierced, which even in the bleeding world of professional football got noticed. And I started to smile. And I think it was the first time that anyone had ever seen me smile. <clears throat> and I remember one Friday afternoon, just before the season was due to start, I went to see my hairdresser over in Hyde about getting hair extensions. And she said, well, I can do it now for you if you want. And as we've already established, I'm all about instant gratification. And, yeah, it's like, and I'm there, it's like, get them in. Which is great for about half an hour. And then I suddenly thought, bother, I've got to take photos of footballers on Monday morning. How am I going to pretend to still be Steve? They're going to wonder how a fat ball bloke became this vision of loveliness. <laughs> well, enough of that. I'm not a vision of loveliness. And it's like, <laughs> So, I spent all Friday afternoon on the phone to the football club trying to get over my boss. Emails out of office, phone, no response. I swear a lot. Uh, he finally called me back Saturday afternoon from a family barbecue. And I'm sat in my car on my ex's drive. She's banging on the window and I'm going, She knew I was on hands free. She could hear everything I said, as could the entire street. So I came out to the entire street the same time I came out to the football club, which saved me a job. And my boss comes on the phone and he says, uh, what's the matter? And I was really got to listen before Monday morning. He said, what's the matter? I went, I'm transgender. Now the funny thing is that I did one of his talks at the football club about a year after I came out and he was sat in the audience, which made me a little bit. He came up to me and afterwards he said, do you remember what I said next? I went, you know what, I was sort of freaking out a little bit at that point, so no, I don't. He said, because you lost so much weight so quickly and because it's so urgent that you speak to us, we all thought you were dying. So when you told me, I went, oh, is that all? <laughs> so you go, Premier League Football Club says it's better to be transgender than dying. Which is nice to know. <laughs> but, um, and I, so I went in for a meeting at the Football Club, and, and we're there in the only spot, so I the pitch. And um, there's the chairman of the Football Club, there's the commercial director, there's the general manager of the club, there's the head of media who's my media boss, there's um, <coughs> a 
Eddie Howe, first team manager, and Jason Tindler, assistant manager, and me, in pencil skirt and getting <laughs> First time they'd ever met Sophie, pretty sure it was the first time most of them had ever met a trans woman. I think they all expected David Wayne talking and go, hey! <laughs> so I like to think I was a little bit classier than that. And the first thing that happened was I actually still had a job, which really surprised me. Um, and then Eddie Howe, our manager, turned around and said, what can I do to make this easier for you? Now, when you come out, you can't expect everyone to understand immediately. But if your boss says, what can I do to make this easier for you? That's all you can hope for. He says, you've got to meet the person for a match there. The first time they see me can't be if they're running down the tunnel. Or sort of, they'd be forgiven sort of for doing a double tap. So he arranged for me to go and throw up a train session a couple of days later. And um, the boys were all up warming up. And Eddie Howe came up to me and said, are you scared? I said to him, you know what? For the first time in my life, I'm totally at ease with who I am. So, no, I'm not scared. And they called all the players together in a circle. And our assistant manager stood up and went, suppose you know that's our photographer's changed a bit since last season. Graham Howe, I hope it wasn't so good. Now our captain, Tommy Alfick, ex Brian Coy, just started clapping. And then the rest of the players joined in. And then Tommy said, right, let's go and train. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, who's that? <laughs> I'm about to say, man, I have so much in my head. I mean, I was expecting rainbows and unicorns and marching band, red arrows fly past or something. I mean, but the reality is, it's like, here's a new piece of information, you've got it, now it's going fun. And quite frankly, when someone comes out and this it directly affects you, that's all it is. It's a new piece of information. So I have no idea why so many people seem to get so upset about it. Because it doesn't affect them. In fact, I think one of the best responses I've had to coming out was actually from a guy that I went to secondary school with that I hadn't seen since I was 16 years old. And I came out on the spot year. Um, so that's 32 years since I've last seen him. And he sent me a message on Facebook and went, Well, I'm now wondering how much of my childhood was a lie. It's like, whoa, way to go making it all about you. It's like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to bang my head into the wall at the moment, but I don't want to upset Thomas the Badger. Um, <coughs> so there I was, I was still in football. And then, of course, the thing is, I thought to myself, well, you wanted this, now you've got to go and do it. And I had friends that were terrified of me going back to football. They said, you're going to be abused, you're going to be verbally abused, you're going to be physically abused. It's not safe. And I remember that first match. The car's parked in the car park, and I went to say, yeah, I'm checking my makeup in the mirror in the car and I thought, right, you want it this now, you got to go do it. I remember walking into the media and actually with all my camera gear. Place is full of journalists, obviously. And you know the first thing I noticed? That no one else noticed. <laughs> I walked in there and it's like and I went to him and I sat up by the pitch and started taking breakfast and no one noticed. Now the funny thing is, it wasn't until my story broke in the tabloids about three, four months later that people really paid attention. At which point I, I would have fans coming up to me and hugging me and kissing me and saying, I'm so glad that you can be you. I'm so glad that you're happy now. And I remember one day we were playing Man City, you know, sat there by the touchline getting on the camera gear and my laptop and everything ready. And this lady went all the way down from the back of the stand which is born in very far. And she taps me on the shoulder and goes, you look amazing. Oh, thanks. But I just had so much love and support from people within the supposedly ultra macho sport that, that would never accept someone who was LGBT. In 2017, I remember, I was, I was lying on the beach down at Port Slade, 
Full glamour. <laughs> Bradford, Port Said. <laughs> yeah. So I'm lying on the beach at Port Said, I'm looking at my phone, sunbathing, saying, so, that's it. Theresa May's just called a general election. Because yeah. obviously she needed a big mandate so that she could sort of Brexit out properly. Um, but, so this came up, and I've already been thinking about going into politics for, for the 2020 election. But of course, it's true all that happened. And I remember lying on the beach texting a friend going, Shall I put my name forward? She said, Yeah, go for it. So I put my name down for Kent Town, which obviously I didn't get, and Lloyd Russell Mill went instead, and he seems to be doing an absolutely amazing job, which I'm really impressed with. Um, definitely shaking things up a little bit. And I got East Worthing Insurance. Now, I knew trans people that moved out of that constituency because of the abuse they were getting. And I remember when I went in there, one of the first things that someone in, in the local party said to me was, you do realise this isn't Brighton. No one's going to vote for a trans woman here. Yeah? So, thanks guys, thanks for the work of confidence. But over the next five weeks, I went out and about, I was talking to people, and the only people that made my gender identity an issue were the press. And they were absolutely obsessed with it. Because if I'd been elected, I would have been the first ever trans MP. Out in the streets, it didn't really come up. Except, I remember one guy coming up to me one day and he just said to me, Before you got selected, I knew nothing about you. But so I've seen some of your speeches and, and and I've read something about your story, and I get the feeling that you're going to stand up for the things you believe in, no matter how difficult it is. And that's why I'm voting for you. In 2015, in East Sure, the Labour Party got 9,000 votes. There has never been anyone but a Conservative MP for any constituency that has the word worthy in the title. And I remember in the early hours of June the 9th, we stood on stage at Worthing Assembly Hall. And I sit there and I was just focused on this light at the back of the room, just trying to ignore all the stuff that was going on around me. You've got, got the Tories down here, you've got Lib Dems here, and you've got Labour there, and sort of press and all that staring up at us. And the returning officer steps up to the microphone, and in a constituency where two years earlier we'd only got 9,000 votes, the returning officer stood up and said, Sophie Rose Cook, Labour Party, 20,882. In the space of five weeks, we've increased it. <laughs> it was funny at the count, though, because uh, obviously the Tory MPs used to walk in the men seeing him with politics like that and everything else. He walked in there and we were neck and neck and he was, he was bricking it. So, yeah, yeah that, it, was, it was worth it to that alone. Um, but uh, in the space of five weeks, we increased the Labour vote by 114%. We had one of the biggest wins in the country with a trans woman in a constituency that was known for trans people being handed out of it. You know what, for someone that's spent their whole life hating themselves, getting nearly 21,000 votes is a massive validation of who you are as a person. But it doesn't make you immune. It doesn't make you immune to bigotry and abuse. And I remember a week after the election, I was up in Westminster for a meeting, and I'm walking down the road, and this guy came up to me and he's Virtually an inch away from my face, he grabs hold of the back of my head. He's, he's almost spitting in my face, demanding to see my genitals. It's like, at least buy me dinner first. <laughs> and obviously, he didn't say, can, can I see your genitals? He used a slightly different language. Um, but that abuse is still out there. I've had death threats on Twitter. I, I appeared on Newsnight at the end of last year. Within an hour of appearing on Newsnight, 
I had over a thousand abusive messages. The thing, thing is, I do a lot of talking with businesses, and they all have these big folders for reports and diversity stuff. How you should treat people, how you should talk to people. Okay? And I go in there and I say to them, you don't need any of that. You just need two words. If you lived your life by these two words, the world would very soon become a better place. And those two words are respect everyone. When I was young and I was in the Air Force, I was told that I had to respect officers because they had the Queen's Commission. Being young and stupid, I said, no, no, they have to earn my respect. Now that I'm old and stupid, no one has to earn my respect. They get it automatically. They can lose it really quickly, mind, but, but they get it automatically to begin with. And so, so this still happens. But the interesting thing at the moment is that there's all this argument about trans rights. And I'll give you a clue. There's, there's a clue in the word equality. And that's the word equal. The thing is, so everyone is equal, no one is. Equality is, you can't say I want equality for me, but not for them. That's not equality, that's privilege. The thing is, human rights aren't in your sum equation. Black rights did not come at the cost of white rights. Gay rights did not come at the cost of straight rights. Women's rights did not come at the cost of men's rights. And you know what, trans rights did not come at the cost of women's rights. And so everyone is equal, no one is. That's the whole point of the problem. <laughs> but I still struggle with my mental health. I spent a lifetime suicidal because I wasn't me. And just at the moment I came in, I became suicidal because I was lonely, because I'd lost everyone. I've lost my 20 year relationship, I've lost my family. My, my entire family now is my two youngest kids. And you know what, they're my world. They mean everything to me. But I've lost so much. And I was really shocked. I was back to struggling with self harm, I was back to struggling with suicidal feelings. And um, I. Get, I had to work all this through in my head. And then I came up with a philosophy that actually I need to keep myself safe. And that philosophy is, I know that one day I kill myself because I don't know how to stop feeling this way, but it won't be today. And in the meantime, I'm going to do the best I can to enjoy every single day. And then on the day that I die, in many, many years' time, I'll look back and realise that I didn't get around to doing it. And that's why I've got Not Today written on my wrist. Some books called Not Today. Because there's a couple of different components to that. The first one is that I know that suicide isn't the end of pain. All it does is take your pain and give it to someone else. And I can't do that to my kids. This is my pain to carry, not theirs. I also know that the feeling will pass, because it always does. First time I tried to take my own life, I was 12 years old. Back in January, I was 15. So that's 40 years of suicidal feelings. And I'm still here, because every time I have that feeling, it, it does pass. <coughs> I mean, there's the most popular place to take your life, or one of the popular places to take your own life in America is Golden Gate Bridge. It takes four seconds to fall from the platform of the bridge to the water. A combination of the fall, drowning, and cold water, all those that claims about 95% of people that do it. But the people that survive have a story to tell. And there's this guy. He was, I think he was 19 years old when he jumped off. And as soon as he jumped off, he thought, 
what he did. So, there, there is always a reason to go on. I mean, the only thing about the whole not today philosophy is that sort of Great productivity tool that I use, uh, which is called Get Things Done by Dave Allen. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it. But there's, there's various components to this. The first one is if you have an idea, you need to capture it. And I wish I'd written down and I was allowed to talk about this bit. Um, because then you can stop fixating on it. As soon as you have an idea, you write it down. And you can put on the do list and then you can think about other things. So, suicide is now on my to do list. And we all know how to do this work, don't we? It's like, you, you, you have, sort of, write 96,000 word book, do word count check to see how much more you've got to write. Now, I did lots of word count checks whilst I was writing my book, because it was easier than actually writing a book. So, suicide is now the biggest, most difficult thing on my to-do list. And there's always going to be word counts that need checking long before I get around to doing that one. But the next element of getting things done is the four Ds. And you use the four Ds to process the to-do list. Now, first one is, if it's something that, you know what, really doesn't move you towards your end goal, you delete it. I mean, let's face it, you look at our email inbox, we've all got these emails that we think, oh, I need to reply to that and go, yeah, that's okay. It's like, you know what? Delete them. It's messages that sort of don't always need to be done. <laughs> now, I know that I can't delete suicide from, from my brain. It's hardwired in there somehow because of a lifetime of struggling with it. Uh, if it's something that can be done by someone else, you defer it. But I can't, uh, you, you delegate it. Now, I can't really delegate suicide because then, strictly speaking, not suicide, is it? Comes murder, which is slightly problematic in our society. Um, you, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to sit down with you for a second. Um, if it's something you can do within two minutes, you do it. Well, you know, seriously, I've got a hand flat. Because I'm one of these people that always seems like someone's got a fine here and all the rest of it. So, it's like, I can't do it too much. It's like far too complicated. Well, I must admit, if we, if we had American Sun Wars in this country, I probably wouldn't be here at the moment. Um, because it makes it far too easy to do it in a split second. And the final one is, you defer it. And literally what I've done is I've deferred suicide till a month after my death. That's when I'm going to think about suicide. A month after I die, and not before. So basically what I've done is I've freed myself up to have the days when I feel suicidal because I have no control about when that happens without keeping guilt and shame on top of it. Because it's the guilt and shame that magnifies its ability to hurt you. So, some days I wake up and I feel happy, some days I wake up and feel sad, some days I wake up and feel suicidal. And you know what, I don't treat any of those days any different from each other. On the days I feel suicidal, I wake up and go, feel suicidal today. Right, well, let's get on with life. Because I know I'm not going to do it, and I know that the feeling will pass. And you know what, as soon as you have that mindset, you know what, the feeling passes a lot quicker. And that period of going through it is a lot less painful. When I transitioned, I lost a lot. I lost my family, I lost my home, I lost my relationship. But it was important that actually I gave meaning to my life. Because the price that I paid to be me was so high, if the only thing I'd get out of it was being me, you know what? I don't know if it's worth that price. And that's why I do everything I do. 
And I want to tell you a little story about why I went with starfish. Come starfish, come starfish, starfish, starfish in the book. Anyway, there's a woman walking on the beach, and the beach is covered with starfish. She starts picking them up and throwing them back in the sea. This old lady comes up to me and she says, You do realise there's miles and miles of beach and millions and millions of starfish. You can't hope to make a difference. And no one thinks. And she comes down, she picks up a starfish and throws it back in the sea. And she says, I made a difference to that one. Yeah. Everything I, I do in my life is trying to make a difference to one starfish at a time. Very few of us have the chance to change the world with a single act, but every single one of us has the ability to change the world incrementally every single day through small acts of kindness. We hear a lot about microaggressions, people sort of being rude to people, people pushing people, all this sort of stuff. If you have microaggressions, you can also have micro kindnesses. Smiling at people, opening the door for them. They will love me day to day. Because you know, all of these things make the world a better place. If someone smiles at you and greets you warmly, it lifts your day, doesn't it? We all feel better for that warm human contact. So, I firmly believe that we should be as kind as we can to every single person we meet. And every single day we should try to do something anything to make the world a better place. Because if you don't, then we, we end up with this path of destruction that we seem to be set on at the moment. I mean, I've got an amazing friend over here that I'm not going to point out because she's very shy, but she does beach cleans and she makes amazing art out of the, the stuff that she finds on the beaches. There's people looking over there. I'm, I'm not even going to look at her, I'm just going to look generally around the room. Because she is very shy. Even though she, she did a TED talk alongside me last year in, in the dome, which was brilliant. But she's still shy. But she makes so much difference. And she inspires people by the art that she makes. And it just makes a massive difference to the world when you can go and inspire people. <clears throat> You're so brave. You're so brave. And you know what? After a while, I started thinking, you know what? I don't feel brave. Just not like me. And I get a lot of people say to me, you're inspirational. You know what? I'm not. I'm not special. I'm just me, trying to be me. And in fact, you know, it sort of breaks my heart a little bit that Someone trying to be themselves is actually seen as inspirational or special. Because I think being yourself should be the default position for everyone. So all these people are saying you're so brave. And actually, after a while, I started to realize, you know what, I'm not a brave one. Steve is the person I was before, was the brave one. He was the person who woke up every single day wishing that he was dead. And yet managed to hold it long enough, hold it together long enough for me to be here. The thing is now, I have a love and respect for him that unfortunately that poor tortured soul couldn't have for himself. And I remember I wrote this poem about him. This is the hug that I'd like to give to the brave man who went before, who suffered for years filled with self-loathing and pain, whose bravery and strength meant that I could one day emerge to dance in the rain. He was the brave one. He took the pain. He suffered in silence so I could dance in the rain. He kept me safe, hidden inside. He paid the price, now I feel the pride. He had the strength to fight to the end. 
He was my hero. Thank you, my friend. So, so the question was about sort of how, uh, trans participation in sport and uh, recent comments from Martina and Afras over about trans people having the parties. In fact, she, she even said it was cheating, which was an unfortunate choice of words. Now, the thing is, trans people have been allowed to compete in the sport of their, their, their true gender since 2003. And you know what? There's never been a problem. Not one problem. In, in fact, Martina Navratilova herself played Renee Richards, who was a trans woman, back in the 1970s, and rapidly, rapidly thrashed her. The idea that you have a sporting advantage because you previously had a different set of genitals is, quite frankly, a bit ludicrous when you look at how privilege actually works in sport. There's a lot of stuff in the press about Casper Semenya, who's a South African runner, who actually is somewhere on the intersex spectrum and, and has high, naturally high levels of testosterone. They're now forcing her to take testosterone blockers to suppress her natural level of testosterone. Now, everyone in this room has different levels of testosterone and estrogen in their body. It's, just the way the human body works. Um, and the thing is, when you, when you look at the advantages that an athlete can have, compare the advantages that a Western athlete has in resources and training, and nutrition and sports science and all of these other amazing bits it's a privilege to help enhance their performance compared with someone who's coming out of a third world country. It, it, it's, it's already not a living playing field, is it? But because of the resources that you've got behind you. And the other interesting thing is that sort of, like, hormones have a massive effect on your body. I mean, I now have no upper body strength whatsoever, thanks to the wonderful effects of estrogen. 
I got quite into that boobs, but, but I had my old body strength. And, and that's one of the things. And so, so the thing is, like, if you're going to ban trans women from competing against native women in sports because they've got a specific advantage, despite the fact they're on estrogen and it's reducing muscle mass, what, so you're then going to allow trans guys to compete against them? who are actually taking to Australia, which is increasing muscle mass, purely because they were born with the set of genitals you think is appropriate for that gendered sport. Yes. The thing is that, obviously, we need to make sure that there isn't a problem. Um, but a, a lot of problems that we're seeing at the moment about perceived issues around trans people are being not so much manufactured, but they're, they're, there's definitely an agenda behind them. And, and the fact that transgender people make up 1% of the population, and yet you look at the Sunday Times any Sunday, and pretty much every Sunday there's an anti-trans story on the front page of the Sunday Times. How, how is this 1% of the population? worthy of, of so much coverage in the press. The thing is, like, we, we, we need to actually work together. Because the thing is, all of this is a distraction. The problems in society aren't caused by transgender people. The problems in society are caused by an inherently unfair system that discriminates against people for so many reasons. It discriminates against people because of their gender. It discriminates against people because of their race, because of their religion, because of a disability. And it also discriminates people against people because of their wealth, or specifically their lack of wealth. The system is designed to keep those in power in power. And to keep those in that power without power. And you know what? It's worked really well for <laughs> generations. All the time that we can be kept divided, fighting with themselves, the system carries on as it is. The only way we are ever going to improve the world, the ever, only way we're ever going to save the planet, the only way we are ever going to save ourselves, is through solidarity and working together. We, we are not different boxes. We are all one people. At the end of the day, we are all humans. And this planet is our home. We need to care for this planet. And we need to care for each other. We don't need separate boxes. The world's intersectional. Human race is intersectional. Embrace those differences. Embrace the fact that, you know what, we're not all the same. That's what makes a human race so beautiful. Because it's only by working together that we will ever change it. Solidarity, always. <laughs> Just so everyone knows, I will be going down to the Feminist Bookshop in a second and doing a book signing there. If anyone would like a copy of my wonderful book, 